fibrillation, um, mitral fibrillation. Um, so just to look at our agenda for today. Um, so if anyone could just put their um, roles down in the comments, that'll be useful to know who we have here today. Um, we're going to start with the main um, presentation on atrial fibrillation by Dr. Soheb, who's a cardiologist. Um, and then we'll be back to with me to talk about COF and go through some case studies. Great, so I get started then, uh, Fahim? Yeah. Sure, okay, let me just share my slides. So I'm uh, Afsal Sohab, I'm one of the cardiologists. Uh, at, I work at King George and Queens and also Bart's Heart Centre. Uh, I have a special interest in um, heart rhythm, so I do ablations and uh, AF is very much the bread and butter I look after in clinic every day. Um, so um, thanks for uh, uh, having me talk to you today. So um, uh, I think these were the objectives um, which were um, passed on to us, um, which relate to the um, this particular programme for you. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover these uh, through the duration of the programme. Um, and obviously, if you do have uh, any any questions, you can put them in the chat box and, and, and we'll, I, we'll, there'll definitely be room for discussion at the end. Um, so I'll cover all of these different things. Uh, it's an exhaustive lift. So there'll be some, some uh, so I've kind of coloured them in three to kind of cover three areas. One is kind of general evaluation and finding AF. Um, so screening people, what to do when you first diagnose someone with AF, calculating the Chad's VAS score, etc. Um, then kind of ongoing management, so annual reviews, when to refer on to secondary care. And then the third bit, and it's interesting to see we've got a couple of pharmacists in the chat box as well, um, DOAX, um, when to use warfarin, um, and monitoring of DOAX as well. Um, <clears throat> so we'll kick off. Um, I know Fahim's got some cases uh, for her section, but uh, it's always nice to have one case to kind of hang everything off. Um, so let, let's talk about our hypothetical 62-year-old gentleman. Uh, he was going for a total knee replacement. Um, he's a bit overweight, he's diabetic, and he was found to be an AF during pre-assessment. Um, he's got obstructive sleep apnea, he's on metformin and, uh, and, and ramipril. So he's got a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. What do we do now? Um, so this pre-assessment person said, go back to GP. So it lands, lands in your clinic. Um, they haven't done anything. Um, and you have to kind of start from scratch, which is this gentleman. So that a clinical examination, his blood pressure's a bit up, 153 on 80, heart sounds and normal um, and nothing else to find on examination. And he's had some bloods done as well. He's got completely normal renal function uh, and his full blood count's normal as well. He's not anemic. This is his ECG. It shows AF um, with a heart rate of around 80 beats per minute. And uh, you request a, a, an echo via the community service. He's got a good ejection fraction. He's got a bit of uh, concentric LVH with that hypertension. Um, his left atrium is four centimeters, so not dilated, no valve problems, uh, and uh, no pericardial effusion. So pretty much um, not much to see on the echo scan there. So where do we go? So <laughs> there are lots of guidelines out there, and probably there's two, the two probably reference points, which I think are probably most useful and most practical for really anyone looking after patients with AF. Uh, uh, either the NICE, uh, the NICE guidance, which is very easy to read, and I'm sure most of you will be familiar with that, um, from all the other specialties you you look after, but um, the European Society of Cardiology does a does a um, a very comprehensive guideline. Even though it's quite a big document, it's got lots of nice figures inside which summarise things very briefly. And these this is free free to download from the European Society of Cardiology website. It gets updated every four years. So the last version was was in 2020. Um, but there are really four things you need to consider when you see someone with AF for the first time. The first is really to see what their symptoms are and how you can get them better for the patient. The other thing which there's now a much bigger emphasis on is um, other risk factors and concomitant disease because AF tends not to come on its own. It tends to come with other conditions and we'll talk about that. The third thing and that probably the most urgent thing uh, and the thing we can kind of make the biggest difference in terms of quality and quantity of life is assessing the stroke risk and getting that corrected at the earliest opportunity. And then the, the, the fourth thing is getting the heart rate and heart rhythm under control, uh, depending on the patient's uh, overall clinical status. And we'll go through each of those individually. So they've got this nice graphic um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the guideline. Um, acute, obviously, when they first present, you, there's obviously the issue of acute rhythm control. So 
obviously if a patient's in rapid AF at a rate of 170 and they're unwell, then obviously they need to go to A&E and be stabilized. Uh, but often they're a little bit more stable than that. Um, think about things which might be precipitating the AF and causing it to come on in the first place and then treat those. And we'll go through these individually, but broadly speaking, it'll be things like obesity, AF, type 2 diabetes, sleep apnea, and all of those will also have an effect on the patient's cardiovascular risk. Assessing the stroke risk and in initiating anticoagulation. And the first thing before you even think about rhythm control is getting the heart rate under control, because if they are running at around 120, 130 and a bit short of breath, you want to give them something which will get their heart rate under control. Um, and then you have to think about whether the patient would be suitable to be cardioverted or if they're in paroxysmal AF, what you can do to prevent further episodes of AF with uh, medical therapy in the first instance. So is the patient uh, asymptomatic or, or, or symptomatic? So this, this our particular example of a gentleman, he, he, he was incidentally found to be in AF um, at pre-assessment. So as far as we know, he didn't really have much in the way of symptoms, it's only because he was going for his knee surgery they, that it got picked up. Um, but determining whether a patient, ha patient has symptoms or not really determines what you do next, because that will determine if you want to try cardiovert the patient uh, or give them additional rate control. And you'll often find some, particularly with some of the older patients, they may, may just think, you know, they're a bit more tired or their exercise, exercise tolerance has fallen away, but they may have not picked it up. It might have just crept up on them. But, you know, their, their, their partner or their children might have noticed it. So collateral history is quite important as well. Um, activity level. So now we have a wealth of data. Everyone's got a, a mobile phone. Maybe the number of steps they're doing on their iPhones uh, dropped off as well. So all of these things uh, uh, can tell us a little bit about patient symptoms. But the obvious things with AF are going to be palpitations shortness of breath and fatigue. Uh, occasionally, if they're having bad paroxysms where their heart rate's jumping really quite high, uh, they may be, become dizzy or presyncopal, uh, and they may have episodes of chest pain associated with the fast heart rhythm as well. So I've mentioned uh, risk factors and concomitant disease. So this is really important with AF, because and it's much, something which has really become a much bigger deal over the last five or six years at least. Um, and there are certain risk factors which are definitely tend to uh, predispose people to getting AF. So the one we're all taught about in medical school is thyroid disease and alcohol. And very much that is that it, that, that does uh, dramatically increase your risk of, of, uh, of having AF, uh, you know, alcohol consumption, 21 drinks a week, uh, uh, which is effectively uh, uh, one drink on this guideline is, is um, two units. Um, so um, that increases your risk by 40%, thyroid dysfunction by about 20, uh, up to 40% as well. But the other thing which is we, we're learning more and more about is obesity. So once your BMI goes over 30, definitely you get a much a dramatic, much more dramatic increase in your risk of getting AF. Untreated hypertension is important to think about. Valvular heart disease in particular is really important. Uh, heart failure and sleep apnea is the other one. So it's always useful to ask a patient about their um, about their um any symptoms related to sleep apnea when they have a diagnosis of AF because often you find the two diseases tend to sit together so you want to treat both of them ideally for the patient's uh, quality of life and obviously if you pick up any of those risk factors they need to be addressed individually so type 2 diabetes all the usual things you would do for that uh, and actually in Australia, they, they're kind of really pioneering um, risk factor management in AF. And they found that actually, if you get really on top of patients' um, sim, uh, risk factors, say, you know, engage them in a weight loss program, get really good control of their blood pressure, get them on, on CPAP if they've got sleep apnea, get the, you know, get, the, get, get them controlling the amount of alcohol they drink. You can actually see that actually there's a dramatic fall in the amount of AF that the patient gets. So this is very much part of our treatment strategy. This is more than just giving a patient a drug uh, to control their AF, um, it very much, if you can get, get on top of their lifestyle factors, you can improve um, their symptoms from AF. So when we see this person uh, for the first time, we'll think of, look at, you can weigh them, look at their blood pressure, look at their glycemic control if they're diabetic. An echocardiogram is a very important first line test in somebody who's had a new diagnosis of AF. Um, and you can, that will tell you two things predominantly. A, is the AF giving them any associated LV impairment? Because if AF is poorly controlled, it can cause heart failure. But also I'll tell you if the patient's got valve disease. Now, classically, the one valve lesion which causes AF is mitral stenosis. We tend not to see so much of that in the UK, um, but you know we're in Northeast London. It's a very diverse population from people from all over the world. 
we may come across a lot of people with rheumatic heart disease, um, which you may not see in other parts of the UK. And then symptoms of coronary disease. So does the patient get short of breath or chest pain or anginal symptoms, or have they even got known coronary disease from years ago, which has kind of just been medically managed and needs further optimizing? So the key thing is once you diagnose AF is to ensure that the patient's on appropriate anti anticoagulation. And the phrase I use, don't wait, anticoagulate. So at the earliest opportunity, get the patient on something. Because we know that the strokes from AF are worse than other strokes. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they tend to be uh, fatal in about 50% of patients compared to non-AF related strokes where that number is almost half, about a quarter. So why does AF cause strokes? Well, this is an example. This is a picture, a little video from a transesophageal echo, which we often do before we do an AF ablation. Uh, and the one, the reason why we do that is to look for clots in the heart. And this is the patient's left atrial appendage. Let me turn the, um, uh, I think there's a pointer button on, uh, or maybe not. Um, anyway, you can see that, um, on here, you can see this little thing uh, in the middle of the screen, sort of wobbling around. Uh, that's that's a clot sitting inside the patient's left atrial appendage. So you can imagine if that flew off, it would go into the left ventricle, up the aorta, into the patient's brain, and cause a huge stroke. Uh, and a massive clot like that, you can imagine, can cause a huge stroke. So um, you need to make sure that the patient's given the appropriate anticoagulation to ensure that something like that melts away. So how do you assess that? So this is the most important. So hopefully many of you will be familiar with the CHADS of ASCO. This calculates your annual risk of having a stroke. Um, and uh, it's a score on a scale of one to nine. Um, and each of those, um, uh, these different factors each contribute to the score. So if the patient has a known history of heart failure, um, so that's anyone with an ejection fraction of less than 40% usually, uh, it doesn't include HEFPEF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that gives you one point. Uh, blood pressure, so more than 140 or 90 on two occasions, gives you one point. Being over 75 gives you two point, but if you're over 65 and under 75, you get one point. Ty type two diabetes gives you one point. Having a stroke is bad, so that gives you two points. And vascular disease, so previous MI, peripheral artery disease, or any evidence of aortic plaque will give you one point. And one for being female, but that one for being female only is put in if you have one from any of these other points. So for example, if you've got a lady aged 61, who's got none of these other risk factors, she doesn't score one, she in theory scores zero, because you need to have one of the others for the, for the female to count. And then this on the, on, the, on the right side of the screen, you can see your annual risk of having a stroke. And this is always important to mention to the patient um, when you're talking to them about their risk of having a stroke. When it's zero, essentially you don't have a uh, your your risk of a stroke per year is effectively zero, um, but when it's one, it's about one point three percent, and the numbers pretty much match the score. So one, two, three, four, pretty much is equivalent to one, two, three, and four percent per year of stroke, but then it kind of dramatically jumps up quite a lot. So once you're five and above, you know you're almost looking at ten percent and above risk of stroke in some of these patients. So that's really very high. And remember, when you talk to the patient, it's important to remind them that's every year. So that you know it has almost like a compounding effect. So um, those are the numbers which we use to assess. And we say anyone with a, a score of two, two and above definitely needs anticoagulation. With one, it's a discussion with the patient. With zero, no, they don't need anticoagulation. My own personal practice is anyone with a score of one, I would tend to very strongly encourage them to go on anticoagulation unless they have um, very strong reservations against it. So our patient um, who we're using as our example has a chasvas risk of, of two. Um, so that's a 2.2 annualized risk of a stroke. So he needs to be on anticoagulation. So how do we decide what to put the patient on? So um, this is a flow chart from one of the guide that guideline I showed earlier. So if a patient has mechanical heart valves um, or moderate to severe mitral stenosis, they need to go on warfarin. So they go straight to the end of this chart, which is a vitamin K antagonist and they need to be on, on, on that anticoagulation. And if they've got a mechanical heart valve, they should be on warfarin anyway. Remember, DOACs are contraindicated in people with mechanical heart valves. That doesn't necessarily apply to tissue heart valves, but if it's a metallic valve, they need to be on warfarin. Uh, if they don't, then obviously you do the chas vas score as we've done before. And as I said, zero, they need nothing, not even an antiplatelet. One, it says uh, oral anticoagulation should be considered. 
and I would I would add in strongly because their risk factors are just going to go up with age they're more likely to, to develop hypertension they're eventually going to go above the age of 65 75 so I always say uh, yes rather than no and once they're on it and they're established on it you know you can kind of um, put your mind at rest and if it's above two uh, then you would counsel the patient for a NOAC um, and then we'll go on to the individual NOACs because when NOACs aren't an option um, potentially the patient be, can, can be considered for vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin and I'll talk about left atrial appendage occluding devices um, uh, which are a little plug which you can put in the left atrial appendage which is that little pocket in the left atrium where that clot was sitting in that video I showed earlier. So the other thing you need to consider, so you've established the patient's got AF, you know that their CHAS-VAS score is two or above in our case, you need to look at the patient's risk of bleeding as well, because obviously if they've got a, a massive bleeding tendency and you put them on a DOAC, then that's not going to help the patient, they're just going to bleed and develop complications from bleeding, so you need to make a, a, an assessment. So it used to be the HAS-BLED score we used to use, but NICE have now updated um, their recommendation for um, a bleeding risk score to be the ORBIT score now. Um, this tends to be a little bit less conservative and, and tends to push you more towards anticoagulating patients, but it's also very simple to use. There's only five things you need to think about. One, the hemoglobin, so less than 13 in a male or less than 12 in a female. That gives you a score of two. Being over 74, age of score of one. Previous bleed, so any intracranial bleed, so subdural um, uh, hemorrhagic stroke um, or a GIB will give you a score of two. An EGFR of less than 61, so renal impairment obviously can cause platelet dysfunction and increase your bleeding risk, and, and being on an antiplatelet, so aspirin or clopidogrel will give you a score of one. Um, and then if your score is zero to two, your risk of a bleed per patient 100 years is relatively low at 2.4. Um, three and above goes to medium to high. So once they've got a score of around four and above, you then have to really think about that trade-off between bleeding risk versus protection from a stroke, and that usually involves a conversation with the patient. Uh, about um, where they where they or what you know where, where they where they would like to take things forwards, and sometimes if somebody has a very high bleeding risk, you can still put them on anticoagulation, but it just means the monitoring needs to be more intense, uh, and you need to be a little bit more careful about um, ongoing management of the patient. So when you're assessing a patient um, first for anticoagulation, uh, it's quite diff it can be it can be quite overwhelming because there's quite a lot of information, and all the DOACs have their own little nuances. Um, and it can be quite tricky, particularly if you've got a short period of time and you want to just get the patient safe on an anticoagulation if they've got a very high chance of us risk. But I kind of put, put it into the kind of the rules of threes to keep to, to make sure you're doing it safely. So the, the three are what are the patient's numbers? What are the uh, important comorbidities? And are there any red flag drugs on their drug history? So the three numbers you want to know are the renal function. And as long as they've had something within the last sort of three to six months, that can give you a, a kind of a rough idea while you're waiting for the patient's uh, up to date bloods to come back. Patient's age, and that tends to be 80, because a lot of the DOACs have a have a um, a requirement to consider the age before you dose the patient, and then the patient's weight, because the weight of, uh, will also influence what dose the patient can go on. You need to know what comorbidities the patient has. So, do they have valve disease, in particular mitral stenosis or metal valves? Because obviously, if that's the case, they just need to go on warfarin. Do they have liver disease, because that can affect which, which DOAC you can go on? And is there coronary disease because that might affect whether the patient's on an antiplatelet as well or not? And then there's some drugs which tend to be a bit more mischievous and cause more interactions uh, with uh, DOAC metabolism. And they, they generally speaking, although there's exhaustive lists around, tend to kind of fall into three big groups, which are anti-epileptic medications, transplant meds, and antimicrobials. And that can include things for TB, HIV, or the antifungals in particular. Um, so, you know, often our patient isn't on any of these, so we can kind of forget about that. He, uh, we already know uh, that he doesn't have previous uh, valve disease from his echo and coronary disease. We know there's no previous history and we know from his blood his liver was okay. So we just need to know that his renal function, what his creatinine clearance is, we know his age and his weight, and that puts us in his position to pick a DOAC for him. So this is quite a nice flow chart in that guideline, which kind of tells you what dose the patient can go on. So on this on the left-hand column, you can see the patient's creatinine clearance. And if you Google um, creatinine clearance calculator, uh, MD Calc will come on, come on, come online and give you a very quick way of uh, letting you calculate the creatinine clearance as long as you have the patient's weight and a recent creatinine measurement. If the creatinine is less than 50, usually you need to go on a reduced dose of one of the DOACs. 
So usually 15 of rivaroxaban or 30 of, of uh, adoxaban. And now uh, I know most of uh, most of most of the region or most of the country has been uh, asked to pre pre to prescribe adoxaban ahead of the other adoax uh, for the IIF. Um, if it's above 50, then usually you can go on full dose. Uh, but then there are a few kind of starred bits here. You can see next to 60 of adoxaban and 110 of um, dabigatran and uh, 2.5 of a pixaban. You can see at the bottom, it tells you some things to watch out for. So patients at high risk of bleeding can go on the 110 of dabigatran um, with adoxaban. So if their weight's less than 60 kg, they should go on the lower dose. Uh, um, the lower dose of a pixaban, if you've got two out of three factors. Um, so if you're aged over 80, or if your weight is under 60, or if your creatinine is above 130, if you have any two of those, you go on the lower dose of a pixaban. Um, they've put some orange doses where you should just be a little bit cautious. So once your creatinine clearance goes below 30, a lot of the trials didn't include patients with that level of uh, renal dysfunction. So um, the guidelines ask you to exercise caution when the patient has a renal impairment, but usually you'll be on a lower dose of all of the DOACs and you can't go on dibigotran at all. The other thing to be wary of is below 15 mls per minute creatinine clearance, you can't go on a DOAC uh, or if you're on dialysis. And actually stroke prevention with a DOAC, there's very little data in patients with renal function. And actually, because you tend to get your own intrinsic uh, anticoagulation from the renal failure, the platelet plate dysfunction, often the, 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 the benefits of stroke risk reduction aren't usually seen in that group. So often you'll find renal patients on dialysis, will, even if they've got AF, will not be on anything for stroke prevention. So the drug interactions are kind of, I've, I've, I've alluded to those. So you've got the CYP inhibitors and the inducers. So the inhibitors think of patients with renal transplant and immunosuppression. So uh, this will be the kind of patient who will be on cyclosporin or tacrolimus for their transplant. Um, but they might also be on various antifungals as well uh, if they're on a transplant for, the, you know, for infections, for example, and induces think patients with epilepsy. So things like carbamazepine, phenytoin, but also within that uh, um, rifampicin and um, St. John's wort. Um, and you should also um, uh, look out for patients with an HIV medications because they can have um, individual issues. So I think when you see a patient who doesn't have any of these drugs, you can, you can make the decision and initiation uh, discussion quite quick um, and get on with it. But obviously, if they've got some of these other things, you might need to take a step back, uh, have a look through their drug history, maybe have a chat with your practice pharmacist, um, or even refer to anticoagulation if it's going to be particularly complex. And some of the, with all the trials, they all included slightly different groups of patients. They all have very, very subtle differences in their indication and, and where they work most effectively. Broadly speaking, they all do the same thing. And I think that, that's why the decision was made that we should all ideally go for a doxaban if that's going to offer the most savings to the NHS. Um, but this little flowchart was made um, kind of to make, it, um, to make it a bit easier to sort of select a, a DOAC if there are other issues at play. So, for example, if patients got coronary disease, rivaroxaban had the best uh, evidence in patients who've got coronary disease. Um, people who are particularly high risk of stroke or who've had a previous stroke, um, dabigatran 150 was actually shown to be superior than warfarin. Um, apixaban and doxaban have a slightly better profile in people with previous bleeds. Um, and then the CYP inhibitors, dabigatran and doxaban, seem to be the ones which work best. And we've got our own um, little dosing guideline at... Um, King George and Queens, and this is kind of what we what I look at before I'm writing up a DOAC for someone, um, and I look at for all of these things. So creatinine clearance, hepatic imp impairment, uh, look for all these drugs, and I've put them out all in that summary previously, um, and that helps me point towards whether I go on the full dose or the reduced dose of um, the DOAC, or whether it's a contraindicated. And I'll circulate these to you guys afterwards. Um, but um, we have the same thing for adoxaban. Again, remember with adoxaban. If you've got a weight less than 60 or your creatinine clearance is below 50, you go on the lower dose. Otherwise, you go on the full dose. And again, some of the drugs uh, might mean you need to go on the lower dose. Um, but if you're on a protease inhibitor, pregnant prosthetic heart valve, you can't have it at all. Um, remember, below 15, you can't go on a DOAC uh, at all. Uh, and dibigotran, we tend to use very, very infrequently. But again, this flow chart. Uh, looks a little bit more extensive. Um, again, 80, the age is an important cutoff. They have a way to cut off of 50 in our guideline to go on a lower dose of, of dibigotran. Verapamil um, uh, 
we put people on a on a lower dose um and people requiring PPIs again the lower dose and aspirin clopidogrel a long time non-steroidal is one ten um and again a very similar thing with the pixaban but broadly speaking these are the three numbers to watch out for uh, in the second box um age over age over eighty weight below sixty or creatinine above one thirty three two of those three you go on the lower dose of a pixaban. I find if you learn one of these DOACs really well, and I think the default for us should be a doxaban, then it just makes the rest of it easier um, because the same principles tend to apply. So if you know one really well, you've got one go-to which you can quickly prescribe to the patient if they need it. Um, and I would say focus on a doxaban because that's what we're all being encouraged to do locally. So in some patients, anticoagulation won't be an option. So they they, they might have a high stroke risk, but they may have had uh, an allergy to the DOACs, they might have had bleeding complications, they might have had ulcers, um, there might be other reasons why any putting them on a DOAC might increase their risk of a bleed. The classic one is somebody who's had an intracranial bleed and putting them on a DOAC might increase their risk of having a further bleed. And in those patients, we put in, we can sometimes put in something called a left atrial appendage occlusion device. So these are these little parachute shaped or plug shaped um, devices, which we go up through the femoral vein into the heart and deploy into the left atrial appendage. It, it kind of plugs off that hole and it endothelializes and it reduces the risk of a clot forming. 90% um, of clots are felt to come from the left, uh, left atrial appendage from autopsy data. So plugging that off can have a can reduce the risk of a stroke. You do need to temporarily be on some antiplatelets after that goes in for a few months. Uh, it's a very expensive procedure. It's a very high risk procedure. Um, there were lots of financial restrictions on getting this done in the NHS, but it can be done in very limited circumstances in very limited centres. And we're fortunate to have the Bart's Heart Centre, which is one of those places where it can be done. Uh, and we do reasonable volumes of those. But again, if they're referred into secondary care, uh, they'll be funneled into um, a clinic where they can be assessed for this. So the other thing to think about is patients who are also on antiplatelets. So if a patient so broadly speaking, we try and avoid having a patient on a DOAC or warfarin plus an antiplatelet, unless there's a very specific indication. And there are lots of historic patients around who are on both. Um, uh, Mittal, uh, one of the pharmacists from Bart's, has actually been going through, going around a lot of the practice in the BH, BHR region. And many of you may have met him already, and he's identified a lot of these patients. And we've had an MDT discussion about stopping the antiplatelets if they're on a DOAC. Um, there's strong data now that DOAC on its own in somebody with a previous stent or previous coronary disease is enough. The only exception is if they're within a year of an ACS or a stent. And then you'll usually get a fairly individualized plan of the person who's put the stent in or the person who's discharged them after their ACS, uh, the cardiologist. And there'll be some sort of plan. And usually they'll go on aspirin plus clopidogrel plus a DOAC for no more than four weeks in most cases but very occasionally longer if there's a worries about where the stent in or is if, if there's extensive coronary disease. But usually they'll go on, on all three for about a month. And then after that, they'll go on clopidogrel or ticagrelor, one of, the, one of the newer ones, with a DOAC for up to a year. And then after the year, it stops. Um, uh, but usually no more. It's very rare beyond that year to be on an on a, on a antiplatelet in addition to a DOAC. So that's anticoagulation. Hopefully we can pick up some of those points um, in our discussion. Um, rate and rhythm control, when to refer. So rhythm control. So if the patient's in AF, they're rate controlled, they're still getting symptoms, which are quite different to what they had prior to being in AF, then you may want to consider the patient for a cardioversion. Um, in patients who aren't symptomatic, actually the indication for rhythm control is actually um, quite poor, unless there's evidence of heart failure on their echo. So what do you give and how much to give? So obviously the patient needs an echo to see if they've got heart failure, but the target tends to be a little bit lenient because we know if we're very strict with heart rate control and try and bring the heart rate right down to 50, 60, actually you can get adverse effects from the drugs. So as long as you can get the patient free of symptoms and their heart rate below 110, that's the target. Um, if the ejection fraction is below 40, um, beta blockers and digoxin tend to be favorable. Um, and if it's above 40, then you can also use verapamil or diltiazem. Uh, we would usually say start with the top beta blocker and then add in digoxin afterwards. And sometimes you need to have three agents to really bring it under control. But I think, I think that's probably one of the occasions where you do want to refer to secondary care because monitoring those patients when they're on three agents can be quite tricky and they can they are, they are at a high risk of developing uh, adverse effects and actually ablation and other approaches may be more suitable for those patients. So rhythm control, again, if a patient's getting bad paroxysmal AF, what do we use? So 
um, so you could try off with a simple beta blocker, but that tends to bring the heart rate under control when they go into AF and doesn't always reduce the chance of them getting AF. So what are the options for rhythm control? There's uh, AF ablation. So referring to my clinic at uh, King George for that. Um, but there are other drugs you can use, such as flecainide, particularly if there's no evidence of coronary disease. Um, Sotolol is very effective. We tend not to use dronadrone very much. Amiodarone you can use as well. But um, again, you need to be wary of the effects it has on the thyroid, the lungs, uh, and the liver. So they need to have all of that checked before initiating and also a chest x-ray ideally as well, and then monitoring for that um, annually if they're on it long-term. But usually we try not to keep on people on long-term amiodarone unless they're really unsuitable for anything else. So particularly the old frail patients who might not be suitable for an ablation, we might consider long-term amiodarone. But again, catheter ablation, uh, AF ablation, I'll talk about in a moment. But if they've got no heart disease, um, flecainide is a good option. We normally give a little 1.25 of bisoprolol with that um, to reduce the risk of flecainide and a related flutter. Uh, coronary disease, we want to avoid flecainide. Um, so we might use uh, sotolol as our preferred agent. Patients got heart failure, um, then amiodarone potentially could be used. But again, you know, I guess a lot of these are, I guess if 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 the patient's safely established on flecainide and sotolol, and often that would probably happen in secondary care, that is a usually a good term, a good long term option. But most of the others tend to have their flaws. Um, so when to refer? So recurrence of AF after cardioversion, or if or uh, or or other rhythm control procedures such as ablation or if you're un unable to get on top of the patient's symptoms with the medications you've used. And then what would we do? We would consider a patient for an AF ablation. So this is what I do over at Bart's. Um, this is where we put catheters into the left atrium. We go up um, through the femoral vein. We make a puncture in the left atrium, into the left atrium. And then either we inflate a balloon and freeze the four pulmonary veins draining into the heart with a cryo balloon, which is the top panel here. Or we can use radio frequency where we use a, a small catheter and literally kind of spot weld all the way around the pulmonary veins and that electrically disconnects the pulmonary veins which is where AF tends to be triggered off from um, uh, from the rest of the atrium and in patients with paroxysmal AF this is a very effective procedure and this is probably and you can you can see much more preferable to being on uh, drugs which sort of really difficult side effect profiles like flecainide and sotolol um, because it can be more than 90% uh, effective in the correct group tends to be slightly less effective in people with persistent AF. Um, and it tends to be uh, much less effective in people who are obese. So we would always say, try and lose some weight before you think about rhythm control procedure, if you can. Uh, once your BMI goes above 35, we have a lot of restrictions. So there was even a discussion amongst from NHS England that uh, AF ablation shouldn't be funded at all for people with a BMI above 35 unless they lose some weight. We can do this under general local anesthetic. It used to be quite a big deal. Patients used to stay in overnight, but often we can get home people on the same day now. Recovery tends to be at least a week, up to four weeks. Um, and you can get flare-ups of AF in the first three months after an ablation. Uh, and for any AF ablation, even if the Chasvask risk is Chasvask score is zero, you need to be on a DOAC for the first three months after the procedure at least. And often we'll trial the patient on a DOAC for at least three to four weeks before the procedure to ensure the patient can tolerate it because... Um, when you're, you can see when you're kind of cauterizing or burning the atrium, you can imagine there's a tendency for clots to form, which could fragment and cause a stroke. So you want to make sure that your patients are appropriately anticoagulated. And we know that actually, if you can get in early in a blate paroxysmal AF, your risk of uh, progressing to persistent AF tends to be lower. And there are a couple of trials. One of these is called the ATTEST trial, which show that if you leave paroxysmal AF alone in about 20% of patients, they'll develop persistent AF in the future, which can be dreadful for some patients. Um, but if you get on top of it with an ablation, that number dramatically falls. Um, and it's 10 times as likely. So it's about 10%, 2% in that group. A heart failure, there's also a strong indication for ablation. There was a big trial called the AF, Castle AF trial, which was published a couple of years ago, which shows actually that life expectancy is improved in patients with heart failure if they're treated with ablation at the right time. Um, so annual reviews, what do you want to do? So patients with AF, ideally they should be seen once a year. You want to ensure that their heart rate is adequately controlled with um, appropriate um, rate control medications if they're in persistent AF. Uh, you can assess their rhythm control. So is there a deterioration in the amount of AF they're getting? And if so, do they need to be referred on to secondary care? 
As patients get older, their renal function tends to go off. So you want to make sure they're on the right dose of anticoagulation. So maybe their creatinine clearance was 55 last year, and maybe it's 45 this year. So they need to go from 60 to 30 of adoxaban. Has there been a drop in hemoglobin? Has, has the anticoagulation unmasked an underlying malignancy, for example? Or have they been started on a new drug which messes up their uh, DOAC? Uh, so all of these things are things to watch out in the annual review. And similarly, uh, if you have poorly controlled AF, you can develop left ventricular impairments. So watch out for heart failure symptoms as well. So one short bit on detecting AF, and then I'll hand over to Fahin and we can do some questions. But uh, AF suggest, uh, NICE suggests that manual pal palpation is the way to, uh, to look out for AF uh, if the patient has any symptoms which are related to AF. So breathlessness, palpitations, presyncope or syncope, chest discomfort, or a history of stroke or TIAs. Uh, if the patient gives symptoms which are suspicious of paroxysmal AF, so palpitations which last uh, more than a few minutes, uh, then organise a halter. But officially from the UK Screening Council, there's no official guidance for us to formally screen patients for AF in the way we do so with mammography or cervical screening. Um, that may change as trials come out. But for now, it's, it's really um, if the patient has symptoms uh, and being opportunistic. And how, do you, how can you detect AF? So there's a multitude of things out there. Uh, the uh, Apple Watches has been a game changer. A lot of patients have Apple Watches and can really tightly monitor their AF. And often they'll bring in, uh, show, me, uh, P, uh, show me their app where they've recorded multiple episodes of AF. Um, but you can also have smartphone cameras, the FibriCheck device, which some of you may have used, where you put your finger over a smartphone camera and it can detect pulse regularity and tell the patient if they've got AF. So that's kind of a consumer-led way of doing it. Um, but we can use uh, blood pressure cuffs which uh, detect pulse irregularity, uh, the alive cocardia, and then obviously the old fashioned ways, loop recorders, halter monitors um, uh, out there. So there's a multitude of stuff out there. Uh, I know a lot of practices, I know all of the ones in Redbridge were issued with a, a life core at one point, but I don't know if that's still going. Um, but there's a lot out there to help you detect AF. Pretty much all of these, which I've got up on the screen have had some sort of external validation. Uh, and are very good for detecting AF. Ideally, what you want, in, if you suspect AF or one of these devices is detected AF, is to confirm it on an ECG. The cardio ECG is sufficient to say the patient has AF. So what do we do with our patient? So he's been anticoagulated, he's been put all the right drugs, but he's now having his knee surgery. What do we do with anticoagulation? I'll put this up because this is very useful because this is a very common question and we get on our advice and guidance service at BHR uh, about stopping DOACs before surgery. Um, so again, this is um, this is from um, the ESC's uh, DOAC um, uh, handbook. Um, a lot of the time, it'll tell you if a patient, the decision about when to stop a DOAC before surgery is determined by the bleeding risk of the procedure. So very high risk surgery, so things like a AAA repair, um, you might stop um, potentially two days before the surgery. If it's a very minor op, such as having their tooth out, they can usually just stop it in the morning um, and restart it at an appropriate phase afterwards once the bleeding stop and then uh, low bleeding risk uh, tends to be somewhere in the middle and this is the um, how they've defined them so things like dental extractions is the, the minor bleeding risk stuff cataracts glaucomas endoscopies um, and tiny kind of abscess incisions uh, intermediate risk uh, low bleeding risk that's endoscopies prostate bladder biopsies um, and then cardiac procedures which the cardiologist hopefully should tell you what to do and then the more um, complex stuff thoracic abdominal major orthopedic will be a high bleeding risk. Um, so again, I think in our guy, uh, we probably put him in that last group. Good, so I'll stop there. That's taking me to time. And I think we've seen, a, I've seen a hand raise. So um, Fahin, shall I take that question and then hand over to you? Yep, that's fine. There's yeah, some that's questions in the chat as well. Okay, cool. Okay, let's go through those. So let me just, um, if I, uh, let, let me just stop sharing because then I can see the questions, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, good. Okay. Well, wh why don't you read out the questions for me while I'm uh, figuring out what to do? Uh, Sorry. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shanika had a few questions. Um, yep. Do you want to unmute yourself and just ask your questions? Uh, yeah, I can see the chat box now. Good. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, so there we go. So let's start from... 
So it's just Shanika, yeah. So yeah. So if a patient's had a successful cardioversion or other procedures, should they still be on a JOAC? Do so this is a very important question. Um, your risk of a your stroke risk related to your AF is going to be there forever. So if a patient has a chasvascular risk of two or more, even if they've had a cardioversion or an ablation procedure and they've been in sinus for a long period of time, uh, if their chasvascular is high, we always say they should continue the DOAC lifelong. Um, there are some studies underway to see whether a DOACs can safely be stopped. Um, um, but what tends to happen is even if you, you're very good at treating the patients um, with ablation or, or cardioversion, they can still have small, ep short episodes of subclinical AF, which are there for a few minutes, and the stroke risk remains. So we um, we we um, uh, say we should continue they, we should continue DOAX lifelong. Uh, Dr. Shah, surgical removal of the atri atrial appendage uh, is an option, and this is a very important one. Uh, thanks for bringing that up because actually there's, there was a recent trial actually last year where. Uh, if a patient had AF and the, and the patient was going for a coronary artery bypass, for example, the surgeons empirically just cut off the atrial appendage and sewed it up at the same time they're doing the bypass. Uh, and those patients actually benefited from having that procedure and had a lower stroke risk. So actually that is being done increasingly. Um, uh, would you go in and surgically cut out the atrial appendage on its own if the patient didn't have any other reason to have cardiac surgery, such as a valve or a bypass? We're not doing that yet, but who knows where we're going to end up uh, in a few years' time. Um, uh, we will, I will, we will send copies of slides. Uh, what is the consensus of anything for initiating patients on DOACs and primary care? I think I strongly recommend it. Uh, I think the, the, this is part of the education program to try and help uh, people build confidence in prescribing DOACs. Uh, something like a doxaban is actually quite simple to use. There aren't that many kind of nuances and contraindications and, and, and funny sort of elements to prescribing a doxaban. Um, if you, it's probably the simplest of the four to prescribe. Um, you just need to know the patient's way to correct and clearance and then just make sure there's the one or two drugs which they can't go on. Um, uh, and very much, I would say, initiate. Uh, if you're unsure about the dose or if there's any, any other issues, you can initiate and refer to anti clinic and they can kind of optimize things kind of perfect later on. But certainly you, you need to, you know, remember the, the risk of a fatal stroke from AF is, is 50% um, if, if, uh, uh, if you get a stroke with AF. So, uh, you know, it's potentially life-saving, not delaying that uh, initiation of DOAC for the, you know, however long the waiting list is for anti clinic. Uh, Dr. Devchan can ask if someone was detected with AF and symptomatic, but their 24-hour ECG was normal. And we started on um, uh, Rivaroxaban. What would be the next step there? So, if they had, if if you've seen AF uh, somewhere, um, and even if the subsequent twenty four hour ECG is 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 normal, it depends what you mean. If you've detected the AF, if you've just noticed an abnormal pulse on a pulse check, that could be anything. Remember, that could be ectopic beats, it could be sinus arrhythmia. It may not necessarily be AF, but if you've seen Can it on, on a twelve lead, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I saw yeah. this patient, and yeah. um, they had suffering from palpitations. Yeah. And we did the thing that they put their two fingers in, which detected the cardia. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then when he came back, obviously we started him on the river Oxaban. Yeah. And his palpitations stopped. Um, yeah. But when he had his ECG, it was fine. He was in sinus rhythm and. Yeah. So at that point, what do we do about the river Oxaban now? Because we don't. Oh, I would carry it on because the so nice now say an alive core cardia detected AF. And if you're not sure about if you if you've got some doubts about whether the cardia is accurate or not, you can always yeah. send it to us. You can always yeah. send it to us on advice and guidance, and we can give a give you a second pair of eyes because we spend a lot of time looking at these. Mm -hmm. Um then um, I would still carry on because so it sounds like the no patient real, may have, have. There's no have, real risks of continuing the rivaroxaban if they haven't got AF. Uh, not really, uh, no. I mean, what it's kind of it's, it's exactly it's that risk benefit thing, isn't it? If if you're fairly confident with the the cardia being uh, accurate and showing AF, then you need to offer the patient some stroke prevention. And the patient will often tell you, "Oh, I had the, I had the 24 hour ECG on, but I didn't have any palpitations that day." But the day yeah, I, yeah. I did, he didn't. He he was fine. Yeah. He, he and the did. day I did the cardio, I was actually feeling quite unwell. So that's pretty convincing in my eyes um, that the patient has a diagnosis of AF. And if that's the case, then 
carry on the reverb. Okay, I can still refer for advice and guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, and, and, and uh, what's even, yeah. yeah. And what's even better is if you've got a recording of the cardia, um, and we can have a look at the tracing from the cardia two finger thing. Okay. Uh, Cause sometimes the cardia can be wrong, but yeah, but usually it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, we've got Nancy Cross is having PVC and PAC the same risk. So no, so stroke risk, you don't see. So with lots of atrial ectopics, there is um, a growing body of evidence. If you have sort of more than 10% atrial ectopics that you may develop AF at some stage in the future, but on its own, it doesn't increase your risk of a stroke. Uh, Dr. Shoaib, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand because I can't see that icon. Uh, okay, yeah, who are you? If you introduce yourself. Uh, Dr. Shah. I'm oh, hi, Dr. Shah, hi. Hello, hello I'm GP in Good Maze. Yeah. Uh, can I swap your patient of 62 year old diabetic with knee replacement? Yeah. 60 year old diabetic who has gone into hospital with the CAP. Yeah. Uh, found discharge letter says uh, found to be an atrial fibrillation, but reverted to sinus rhythm uh, and very comprehensive GP advice. Please yeah. follow. Yeah. So I uh, just wanted to clarify uh, how and how often and how these patients should be followed up? So I think, I, to be honest, if somebody's de developed AF with pneumonia, uh, but it's all got, got better when their pneumonia's got better, I think they're, they're, they're a very high risk. So let's say they get winter flu next year. There's a high, very high risk that they're going to get AF with that as well. So I would treat them as any other patient with paroxysmal AF. So I would anticoagulate them if their Chasvas score is appropriate for anticoagulation. I would add them to your AF register as everyone. Uh, but if their symptoms are well controlled, apart from anticoagulation and maybe a bit of beta blocker if they've got symptoms, maybe not. Um, they, they, I would, they, they would just have the whatever annual review is you, you have processes in place for for your AF patients. But I, I would continue the anticoagulation in that case personally. Okay. And uh, uh, your comment about uh, lack of any uh, guidance on the mass screening of population for AF yeah. is interesting because... Uh, yeah. As you alluded to, in Redbridge, we were given this cardio core and we were getting people uh, over 65 day in and day out to check their pulses. <laughs> it depends, isn't it? I think if they're coming into the GP to see you for some other reason, I don't think there's a massive harm in just getting to them to put their fingers on the cardio, right? I guess it's it's that thing where you kind of line up every 65 year old in the in the count in in you know in the in the borough and line them up to come in and have their pulse checked. And uh, the official guidance is no, but I guess. It's opportunistic, isn't it? And often when they're coming into GP, there's obviously some other symptom they have. Uh, and symptoms from AF can be quite broad. But as you say, yeah, we, we're, we're probably quite proactive here um, in Barking, Havering and Redbridge about looking out for AF, even though it's not the official guidance. But I think one of the pushes for us doing that is that um, all of the different regions in the UK, you can make kind of an actu actuarial assessment for how much AF should be present in, a, in an area based on the age yeah. um, and it was felt that we were missing a lot of AF in our region and I think that was probably the bigger push to us looking a bit harder um, and our stroke unit similarly uh, at Queen's was seeing a lot of patients coming in with strokes and AF where the AF hadn't been detected previously so there was kind of there's been a feeling that we're probably missing AF for whatever reason I know there are lots of challenges locally um, uh, so maybe I think that's probably why there's been a bit more of a push to be a bit more proactive about finding AF than the official National Screening Council guidance was probably saying. Yeah, but uh, in my experience, we did before COVID, we did a lot of this. Yeah. And uh, the output was actually quite low. As in the number of in number patients of you found detected, with AF. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, that's it, isn't it? I think we're, we're, we're yeah, I think one of the other, G uh, we had a, a meeting with one of the GPs about some pathways or something, and he was... He, he suggested that actually these numbers, which are supposed to predict how much AF you get in a local population is probably wrong um, for, for our region, because um, a, lot, a lot of these studies are kind of from Sweden or Denmark, and they have a very different patient profile. You tend to see patients, AF more in patients who are very tall, very obese. Um, and, and, you know, we've got a very ethnically diverse population. And, and in the Asian population in particular, the risk of getting AF is about 30% compared to the equivalent um, white Caucasian person. So we may genuinely have slightly less AF in this region than, the, 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 than the, the, rather than us missing it as well. So that's another potential reason why 
uh, those numbers have come up. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Was there anything else I was missing in there, Fahin? I've tried to look through and uh, pick up. No, I think that's it. Um, Shanika asked a question earlier, um, saying what is the basis for the contraindication? Um, did you want to elaborate on that, Shanika? Because I can't remember what that part was Con about. Yeah, contra contra contraindication to what, uh, Shanika? And type into the comments. Sorry, I think I think it was me, but my, my name is Gurpri. I don't I don't know why oh. I'm understanding this thing. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Gurpri. Hi, um, it was the um, contraindication for DOAX with the mechanical heart valves. What, what oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so they've done uh, some of some of this is kind of basic science lab testing. Um, and for whatever reason, I think there's something about the metal on the valve, which I don't know. Um, and then similarly, it's clinical trial data, which shows that they're, they're more likely to have adverse events if they're on a DOAX rather than warfarin. Um, it's not fully understood, uh, um, but it's something about the mechanics of the metal, which mean that the warfarin is much better at stopping clot from building up, building up on the on the on the metal valve. Okay, I think that's everyone. Is it? Yeah, Doctor Shaw, I've just one other. Uh, can we not have drug eluting valves uh, like we have drug eluting stands? Oh, maybe one day. Yeah, <laughs> I suspect we will do. <laughs> that would that would that would save such a lot of headache, wouldn't it? It would that would that would mean we, we, we there'd be even less of a reason for anticoagulation clinic. Um, but yes, good. Fahim, do you want to take over then? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so if you stop sharing the slides, and then I can share my. Yep, yep I'll stop sharing that. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to start by speaking about quaff. Um, hold on, let me put it to a slideshow. So, um, so first we'll just speak about um, the reason why AF is included as a quaff indicator. So AF is the most common heart rhythm disorder affecting about 2% of the adult population. It's a significant risk factor for stroke. It's responsible, well, thought to be responsible for about 20% of all strokes. And the risk of stroke is five times higher for patients with AF than in people who do not have AF. Um, it's associated with increased mortality and significant morbidity. So obviously it's important that we detect these patients and manage them appropriately. So this is the table from the Quaff booklet from this year. Um, so there are 401 points over the clinical domain. So quite a lot of the points are for AF. So that's 29 points are for AF. So that's quite a lot. Um, so GP practices are rewarded for achieving these points and targets. So let's go through these. So the first one is establishing and maintaining a register. So that's quite straightforward. As long as the patients are coded, um, a register, like if you're using EMIS, then um, you can just search for them in population reporting, and that would be your register. So it's really important to code these patients and using a QOF code. So you'd code anyone with AF, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or paroxysmal AF. Um, there's a bit of a debate about whether you should still leave them coded if their AF has resolved. Um, there's an argument that you should leave them as coded because even if their AF has resolved, the fact that they've had AF in the past puts them at higher risk of stroke than someone who's never had AF. Um, so moving on to the other indicators, which are the bulk of the points, um, these are quite straightforward also. So the first area is that in patients who have a risk score of zero or one, Chad's Vax score of zero or one, that you should review them every 12 months and recalculate that score um, just to make sure it's not become two or more, in which case they should be on anticoagulation therapy. Um, and so the target for that is 90% ideally to achieve the full points. Um, and then for those who have a score of two or more, it's to, um, to review those and to see if they are currently being treated with anticoagulation therapy. And um, so we're aiming for 70% or more there. Obviously, there will be some patients who have contraindications or 
choose not to go on to um, a DOAC or anticoagulation, um, they can be exception reported. So does anyone have any questions about QOF before we go on to some case studies? Uh, did your slide move forward? I, I can see the one which says uh, AF007. Was there another one after that? Mm, no. Okay. That's what I mean. So uh, 06 is the one where you assess people with a score of zero or one existing. And then 07 is the one where the people who are already on two are just reassessed and to make sure they're on anticoagulation therapy. Yeah, I don't see any questions. I'm not sure if the chat comes up for me. Okay, that's fine. I so, can't see anything in the chat. So, no. so, okay, yeah. so if we move on to some case studies. Okay, so I've got five case studies. They're all quite straightforward. And I would encourage some participation, please. So either in comments or feel free to unmute and join in. Um, and as I said, they're all quite straightforward, but have slightly different learning points. So we will start with patient A. He's a 66-year-old male. He's coming for a book in the day appointment in the afternoon, so an urgent same-day appointment. He's saying that since morning, he's been experiencing increasing shortness of breath, dizziness, and feeling of his heart racing. Past medical history known to have hypertension, and he's on amlodipine and ramipril. So on examination, he appears breathless. His heart rate is 160 and irregular. His blood pressure is 100 over 60. Respiratory rate is 24 and SATs are 92%. So what immediate investigation would be most useful at this point? So if we could have some answers in the comments, that would be great. Yep, thank you. So yes, ECG is the first thing that would be most useful. Um, obviously, not everyone has access to this in their GP practice. If you don't, then you just go by the clinical picture and assume that this may be AF. If you do have an ECG, then... Oh, we're gone. So this is an ECG I've nicked from somewhere else. So it does have the report on there. Um, so looking at this, there's no P waves. Um, it's irregular rhythm with a, a heart rate of about 151. So this is AF and it also has a left bundle branch block. So now what shall we do with this patient? So the options are start a DOAC, start a beta blocker, start amiodarone or send into hospital same day to be considered for cardioversion. So any thoughts on that? So I guess people can put their choices in the chat box, can't yeah. they? A, B, C, or D. Yep. So do Chad Spask and Orbit. Yes, so we will do that. There's no wrong answer. So all of these are possible options. Probably wouldn't start on your drone as a GP, but the rest are all options. We've got some A and A and B as some as one option. Yeah. So the patient can be considered for D because it's a new onset of symptoms within the past 48 hours and he seems quite unwell. So his heart rate is um, 160 um, and he's breathless. His SATs aren't great either. So his BP is a little bit low. So it could be that he may benefit from a same day assessment. Um, so that would be an option. What would you say, Dr. Sahib? Do you think if you... I, I would, yeah, I would definitely... I, I, I work in hospitals, so I'm always more comfortable when, when, I, when I see people in hospital. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I think if he's got low SATs and his heart rate's above 150, um, I, I would send him in, um, especially if he's got, got symptoms with it, I would, I, would, I would probably send him in. But um, if, you know, if the heart rate was a little bit slower or if he didn't have symptoms, then you could uh, conceivably do A and B. Uh, and then and then start the rest but yeah i think i i with this case i would go for d mm -hmm. okay great any questions about that or oh, there's someone in the chat oh no sorry that was just the options okay so let's move on to the next one 
which is patient B. Um, so this is a 68 year old female. She's come in to see the nurse just for a routine BP check, known hypertension on amlodipine. Um, blood pressure is okay, it's 136 over 87, but the pulse is noted to be 115. So the nurse checks this manually and finds it to be irregular. Has a listen to the heart, sounds okay. Um, she's asymptomatic. She's got no past medical history other than the hypertension. So the nurse does an ECG for her um, as she's suspecting AF. And this does confirm AF, again, no P waves and a rate of about 117. So what would be the investigations we should arrange for this patient? There can be more than one answer. So you can put some, some of your answers in the chat. So we've got some A's and some uh, an A and a C. So blood test, halt monitor. A and B. So don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could do some blood tests. A and tests. B. A and B, seem, yeah. a, and, a and B seems to be the winners. No, yeah. no, nobody's saying no investigation. Everyone thinks we okay. need to do some tests. So that's that's so, our general consensus. Yeah. So blood tests rule out an underlying lying thyroid problem. Um, an echo is obviously helpful. Hold to monitor, possibly, I'm not sure how much that would add if we already have an ECG showing AF. Um, so the patient has bloods done. They're all normal. HB is normal. EGFR is more than 60 and creatinine clearance using the calculation comes out as 57. The echo shows mild left ventricular hypertrophy and mild left atrial enlargement, which is nothing too significant. So let's work out this patient's chad back score. Would anyone like to have a go? So just to remind you, her age is 68 and she has a history of hypertension, no other medical problems. So feel free to either unmute or put it into the chat. Yeah, you can just put a number in the chat box, couldn't you? Everyone's saying yep. three. Yep, so that's right. So hypertension should score one for that, one for being in the age 65 to 74 category and one for being female. So that's three. So what are you thinking now? So. A, start a DOAC, B, start a beta blocker, C, start amiodarone, or D, send into hospital to be considered for cardioversion. There can be more than one answer. Yeah, got an It's got one, one for start a DOAC, yeah. yeah. A. Yep, yeah, sounds like a good option. So according to, if we go back to this table, so her score is three, so that's more than two. So she should ideally be on um, anticoagulation therapy. So you could also, because the rate is a bit high, you could also consider a beta blocker. Um, so start the DOAC, start a beta blocker. So they say, apart from Sotolol, any of the others, people often start with Zoprolol and the titrate up. So then from here, how often should we monitor her user knees? Um, her creatinine clearance is 57. I'm not expecting anyone to know. I think the pharmacists might know. There's a few pharmacists here. So if anyone. So we've got five to six months, three months. Okay. Six months. Okay. This is a difficult one to know without referring to a table. Um, so. So if the creatinine clearance is more than 60, they say you can just do it annually. Um, if it's 30, between 30 and 60, then it should be six monthly. Um, so that would apply to our patient. Uh, and you should also do it six monthly if they're aged over 75 or frail, which do not apply to this patient, but her creatinine clearance is between 30 and 60. Or if their creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30, then you should do it three monthly. Okay, anyone got any questions about case study two before we move on? Or any comments? 
No. Okay. So moving on to case study three. Oh, skipped one. Okay. So this is a fifty-four-year-old male. Over the past three months, he has noticed intermittent episodes where his Fitbit has picked up a pulse rate of up to 130 at rest. These episodes last up to five or 10 minutes, then goes back to a pulse rate of 60 to 80, which is the patient's baseline. However, over the past week, he has had three such episodes. The latest episode lasted four hours, during which he felt his heart racing and skipping beats. So he put it down to a night out where he consumed a large amount of alcohol and said he probably just ate something dodgy. So he's come in saying, oh, I really don't want to waste your time. But what my wife insisted I come in and get myself checked. So, on, um, so he doesn't have any past medical history, not on any medications, no family history, non-smoker, no recreational drug use. His weight is 72 and a BMI of 23. So overall, quite a healthy chap. So on examination, he appears very well. His blood pressure is perfect, 120 over 80. Heart rate 74 regular. Respiratory rate is 16. SATs are 100%. Hearts, heart sounds are normal. Chest is clear, no peripheral edema. So you almost feel like, are we imagining it? So should we investigate this patient further? And if so, what should we do now? So we could either do a 12 lead ECG, which is option A. Option B is a 24 hour ECG. Option C is an event recorder. So that usually is about seven days, but can vary. Um, and should we do bloods as well? I'm getting a bit lost though. I can't tell if people have answered to the current. B, uh, B, and, B and D. Okay. B, so we've had a few Bs. Pretty much everyone said B and then a couple of people have said D as well. Yeah. So they're all possible options. Um, it's just a matter of with the um, ECGs, which one is most likely to pick up the event. You could do a 12 lead ECG, but um, currently he seems to be in sinus rhythm. So you're unlikely to pick anything up. But if that's what's available to you and it's easily accessible, then why not? It might be an option as a baseline investigation um, because the others might take some time. Um, 24 hour ECG. So we said that he's had three episodes in the past week. So it's not necessarily daily. It might be an option, but it might also not pick up an event. Um, so an event record would be ideal because you probably would pick up an event, but it's a matter of how accessible that is and how easy it is to request that. So all possible options, ideally an event recorder, if not 24 hour ECG is good. And yes, should have some bloods to look for an underlying cause such as um, such as a thyroid issue, or even maybe he's anemic or um, got palpitations due to that. So FBC thyroid function, and we probably use, do the baseline using these. So he has an event recorder and it confirms his parasitic AF with five episodes detected over a seven day period with a heart rate of between 100 to 136. So now let's work out his Chad Spasco. So we said he was 54 and has no past medical history. So anyone want to contribute what his score would be? They've got zeros coming up. Yep. Looks like it's zero. Mm. So what shall we do with him now? So option A is no treatment required. B is start a DOAC. C, start a beta blocker. Or D, send into hospital same day to be considered for cardioversion. Again, not necessarily one particular right answer. So getting a, a bit of a range here. We've got A, B, and D. Yeah. Nobody wants to start a beta blocker so far. Okay. So yeah, it's an option to not treat. It's also partly the patient decision, how symptomatic they are. Um, with the Chadsvaskov zero, probably doesn't need a DOAC. Um, beta blocker would be an option if he's having episodes that are between 100 and 130 heart rate. So that's an option also. 
and I probably should have put another option, which was um, send in, not necessarily same day, but refer for ablation. So that would be an option. Um, he's quite well in himself, so possibly doesn't need to be seen the same day. So any of those would be okay. Um, Afsal, would you? Yeah, I'd like. I, I, yeah, I think I, I agree. I think there's a quite a. I don't think he's Tazvas to zero, so there's no urgency to start a DOAC. I think the only contacts you start a DOAC with him is if he got referred into my clinic, for example, and I wanted to do an ablation on him, I'd probably start him on a DOAC before the ablation and then carry that on for three months after um, if he's getting symptoms from the AF. Uh, Dr. Shoeb, can I just uh, ask you a brief question about uh, Holter monitors? Yeah. Uh, when we get the reports, uh, very often it comes with the few SVs or Vs. Yeah. And this gives us the ischemic burden. Uh, how do yeah. we interpret that? So, uh, so we see lots of, um, so with uh, supraventricular ectopics, um, it's usually pretty benign. If it's there more than 10% of the time, as I said, there's a risk the patient may develop AF in the future. So it's just asking the patient to be wary of their symptoms. Uh, ventricular ectopics, again, uh, you know, if you do a halter on anyone, everyone's going to have one or two supraventricular ectopic SV. Everyone will have some Vs and some SVs. Yeah, you know, if we did a halter on everyone on this call, it would be very rare to find somebody with none. Um, so a little bit is fine. Um, you have little runs of supraventricular ectopics. So SV runs is a common comment on, on the halter reports, um, which can sometimes look like AF. But if it's less than 30 seconds, it doesn't count as AF. Um, with ventricular ectopics, once it's more than five, ten percent of the percentage of beats, we would usually say that would trigger off at least an advice and guidance with cardiology or or an echocardiogram. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more um, questions or comments on this particular case? Okay, so let's move on to patient D. So this is an 86 year old male who's got known AF. He's been on apixaban five milligrams BD for more than a year. So he attended a &E two days ago with bleeding from a varicose vein on his right lower leg. Pressure was applied and the bleeding stopped. Um, so um, the advice to a &E advised to stop the apixaban and he was discharged with the advice to see the GP regarding whether to restart the apixaban. So, what information would you want in order to make your decision about whether to restart the apixaban? What would you like to know? Just some ideas in the chat box, please. I think everyone's being a bit quiet. So this is quite a common scenario, actually. So we have our uh, MDT um, with Mittal, the pharmacist from Barts, and, and Angela, who's a hematologist. And a lot of these complex sort of scenarios from primary care we discuss and the GPs come in and join and I know a couple of I know one one or two of the people on the call have been on that MDT before um but everyone a lot of people are saying wait EGFR new drugs creatinine clearance yeah so sounds good so yeah so we've got his weight there 71 creatinine is 97 creatinine clearance is 52 um and on examination, blood pressure is fine, heart rate is 84 and irregular. So um, without going into his past medical history, I'll just tell you his Chad's VAS score is four and his orbit score is one. So score of four is very high risk of stroke and score of one seems low risk of bleeding, although I've only counted his age here, not the fact that he's had this bleed. Because I'm not sure if that would come under what is called a significant bleed in the orbit score. So it's debatable whether that, that would be a one or a two, but probably a one. I agree it would be a one, yeah, because I think the orbit yeah. says an intracranial bleed or GI bleed, so yeah. that, that wouldn't count, yeah. So, and he's on uh, Pixaban five milligrams twice a day. So just to check he's on the correct dose, um, the BNF says that that should be the ideal dose for stroke prevention and a reduced dose of 2.5 milligram twice daily would be used in patients with at least two of the following characteristics, age 80 or over, which he is, weight less than 60, he's 71 kilos, so that doesn't apply to him, creatinine of more than 133, but his creatinine is um, 97, so again, doesn't apply to him. And creatine clearance of 15 to 29, I believe his was in the 50s, so nowhere near. So he's only got one of those and that's his age. 
So according to this, it would imply that that five milligram twice a day is the appropriate dose for him. So we know the Chad's VAS score is four, Orbit score is one. So discuss with the patient and relative because at the end day is their choice after an informed discussion. So you've explained to them that the risk is high of stroke with this Chad's VAS score of four, risk of bleeding is thought to be low. And obviously, you know, you can advise that if you do have bleeding from your varicose vein again, apply some pressure. And if it doesn't stop, go to A&E again. Um, so left the decision with the patient. He says, doctor, I'll be led by you. So what would you do now? Option A, stop the apixaban indefinitely. B, continue the apixaban at the current dose. C, continue the apixaban at, the re at a reduced dose. So that'll be 2.5 BD. Or stop the apixaban and refer to anticoagulation clinic. So... I think we've got a B for continue. Yeah. Any other, don't know if any other, somebody said C, continue a pixaban at reduced dose. Mm -hmm. Couple more, I'll be happy with five. <laughs> well, a couple more answers. B, don't, don't be shy, everyone. We've got a B, continue a current dose, a C, and I'll refer him. So we've got one, one for refer and a couple for B. So probably what, yeah, so a, a mixture of Bs and Cs mm -hmm. and referral. So I'd be interested to know what you would do. I mean, technically, he still meets the criteria for five milligrams, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. well, well, did we have his weight on the previous? Yeah, it was 71. Yeah, so he, he he's kind of full dose for everything. Um, mm -hmm. The only one he might be qualified for a reduced dose of is the bigot trend. But um, I mean, clearly, there was um, there, there was a reason, you know, there's, there's it was a one off bleed. Um, it's now healed up. I, I would restart it because his risk of a stroke is massive, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes, I'm really glad you said B. So unfortunately, this is the only patient that is a real patient. You've discussed um, this case with me before, oh, Fahina. Yeah. I remember yeah. we, we had a chat about him, yeah. Um, unfortunately, he died two months later from a bleeding varicose vein. Really rare and really unfortunate, but it did happen. So the lesson with this is that our risk scores are just a guide and we use them to assess the clinical risk profile and take pref patient preference into account to guide treatment options. The outcome's not always what we hope, but we can only go by balancing the risk versus the benefit. Yeah, I think the problem is if you'd done anything else, that would have been wrong by pretty much every, any guidelines. So if you put on the, remember, if you put somebody on a reduced dose and they don't qualify for reduced dose, all you're doing is they still have the bleeding risk of the DOAC, but they don't get the stroke prevention. So that's 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 never the right thing to do. And then I guess with stopping it, I mean, that's a risk benefit judgment, isn't it? Um, I think it's tough. If you're 86 and you've got a good quality of life, the last thing you want is a horrid stroke for your last couple of years. So it's it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, because if he'd died of a stroke and you've reduced the dose or stopped it, then yeah. that would be a more difficult yeah. decision to justify. Yeah, because you've done everything as per guideline there, haven't you? So um yeah okay any questions or comments yeah so dr shah said a referral would have been good to kind of as a safety net i think that's reasonable if you're not unsure i mean we uh, the, uh, do i can't remember if our local anti-coag have a advice and guidance channel as well but certainly cardiology do but um uh definitely if you're not if, if you do want someone else to back it up then you know we're happy to provide that okay okay Oh, yeah. So somebody, one of the um, participants, Queens has a Queens anti coag has advice and guidance. So there, so there's always a, there's always someone to, out there to to potentially give you some extra support with the decision making. Okay, and we don't want to end on that depressing note. So <laughs> have a happier one. So patient B case study two is back. So we'd said that she was going to have a UNE check at six months. So she was the 68 year old female who was diagnosed incidentally on, at a BP check with the nurse. And she was started on rivaroxaban 20 milligrams. She remains asymptomatic, but her creatinine clearance has now dropped to 39. So what do we want to do with her? I think the pharmacist will get this. Well, yeah, as, as predicted, reduced to 15 milligrams. We've got one... Uh reduced dose so we've got a couple of people saying reduced the dose yeah 
So that would be correct. Oh, yeah, so reduce the dose to 15 milligrams. So that's with the correct and clearance of 15 to 49. And we want to end on a happy note. So we'll say she won the lottery and lived happily ever after. So we'll end <laughs> that note. Um, So that's it. Um, anyone got any questions? Yeah, it's good. We'll get, we'll get time. I think we've got about five minutes if anyone's got yeah. uh, any questions. Um, but, yeah. I was going to share just, um, oh, let's see if I can get rid of this. So somebody mentioned about um, possibly feeling a bit nervous about starting DOAX as a GP. So we've got some pro formers that were circulated, which would help possibly make people feel a bit more confident about it. I don't know if people have also seen these, but um, so if you were to start a patient, are you able to see what this uh, We can't, I can't see anything shared at the moment. Oh, okay, let me do that then. Sorry, I'll try and do that. If anyone's got any comments or questions, meanwhile, then go ahead while I try and sort this out. Right, so, and I think Temi's put a um, feedback link to a feedback form. Okay. Um, so yeah. if you if you guys do feel that in, I think it'll be useful for the team here. Okay. So. Share. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we are actually starting uh, do action of a practice. We are not waiting for uh, appointments. Good, excellent. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, I think that's very much the direction of travel. Great. Okay, so you, hopefully you can see. Yeah, we can see a, a Word document yeah. with anticoagulation initiation. Yes. But, um, so, hmm, seeing how I can scroll down. I'm trying to just. So it's got a really good checklist at the end. So if, for people who are not that confident about um, starting it, it would be handy. Um, can you see that double screen now? No, we can just see the top of the form. I can just see the top of the form, which uh, where, where it stops that kind of Chaz Vascor has bled and I can't see anything at the bottom half of the page. Okay. Let's try this. Yeah, can see something now. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So, so this gives you a sort of a checklist of things you can go through. So this is the one for a Pixaban. There's ones for all of the different DOACs. And it tells you what dose and when you would do a reduced dose. So it's quite handy. And then what you could do is complete this and you can send that off to anticoagulation clinic. Um, just more as a reassurance and I think they possibly look over it and let you know if there's any concerns but it was this was basically introduced to reduce the number of referrals to anticoagulation clinic because it was felt that not everyone needs to be referred just because they've got AF. That's great I, I guess you could say you could circulate that to the group and you. Mm -hmm. um... Yeah. Okay. Anyone else got any questions or comments not necessarily related to that or just in general? Um, thank you all for attending. I just wanted to say, yeah, that was very informative for myself as well. So yeah, that was appreciative of um, both of you joining and giving everyone a good presentation. Um, everyone else that's still left in the room, could you kindly, 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 please give us a few minutes, as well as a few minutes to do the feedback um, form. I just wanted to send it over to them as well. So yes, thank you all for joining. Um, if you had anything else to say to the presenters, please say now. Great, thanks. And thanks for, it was great to see everyone participating and answering the questions. It's always nice when uh, you get some engagement. So thanks all. Yeah, thank you all for attending. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, enjoy the weekend, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Event Bright send feedback forms. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you.
Yeah, so co- if you can't do the link now, just sit, copy and paste the link and put it onto your personal mobile phone or your NHS computer, and it should be a Google Docs that come out, and I'll send it through Eventbrite as well. I think most people have left, Tammy. There's only six people left, and that's including us. Yeah, someone else asked me in the chat. Oh, that's okay, fine. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Bye-bye.